Hey everyone, it's our maiden voyage of the To Be Determined Name podcast. I'm Jared Sandler, joined by uh, my friend, former Texas Ranger, former Baylor Bear, and former Allen Eagle. Eagle, is that right? Allen Eagle, you got it right. There you go. How could you not? How could you not know that? Well, I'm sorry. I just I I I guess with the 60 billion dollar stadium, I I forgot what their mascot <laughs> was. It's Sean Tollison here. We are going to be chatting with you. Uh, probably every couple weeks uh, talking about baseball, talking about the Rangers and who knows what else. And uh, excited to do this, Sean, I appreciate you agreeing to put up with me for at least uh, a baseball season. Although I, I spoke to your agent, you do have opt outs after each individual episode. So I guess I got to be good. on my best. Player. Yeah, I'm good. I'm glad you talked to my agent. Cause I sure haven't talked to him in a long time. <laughs> uh, I'm not making him much, I'm not making him much money anymore. So uh, thanks for checking in on him. So, okay, let me, I guess, perfect, perfect way to start this. So I, I think the, the impetus of this, this podcast, this conversation, we're going to, you know, maybe take you inside the clubhouse and, and inside what it's like to be a major leaguer and, and draw from some of the things the Rangers are, are going through and how they might relate to some of Sean's experiences, but also just in general, what, what that major league player life is like, what it's like after you're done playing, We'll obviously talk about things around the baseball world. And one thing I've always wondered, so is your agent still your agent? Like, how does that work? Do you like fire him when you retire or what's the the deal there? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know what the deal is. Um, yeah. What would happen if I started throwing a baseball again and would he automatically be my agent or would I have to find a new one? Those are all good questions. Um, let me, let me call him after this episode. <laughs> and next time we do a recording, I'll give you an update on what those rules are. Uh, cause I really don't know. Well, maybe we can have him on later on this, uh, this year. We will, uh, from time to time. Bring hey, that's some a good guests. idea. Yeah. We can, uh, we can yeah, talk to we get him. an agent agent perspective. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely unique. We'll, uh, we'll bring guests in throughout the, throughout the season to, to talk about this or talk about that. But I, I guess, uh, I kind of more or less know what you're up to these days, but I, I think a lot of fans probably are in the dark. So what is Sean Tollison, the retired major league baseball player doing? Well, I can tell you, I'm not growing as much hair as you are. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> when we like clicked this? on this like camera, this? I mean, dude, I, it's, you know, I, I, I logged on and, I showered this morning and I did my hair and I shaved my face. Those are all three things I'm guessing you did not do today. Um, it looks like you haven't been doing much of any of those three lately. But <laughs> I, so, you used to be used to be such a handsome guy. And now I'm just sitting here looking at this. Is, I mean, is that a, is it a man bun? Is that, is that what I'm looking at? Is that, is that the new you? So I, I worked out this morning. I'm currently in Arizona. And we are two hours behind you. So you've had a two hour head start on your day. Uh, I do plan on showering, but I had to get my morning workout in. And so my hair doesn't like hit my face. Mm -hmm. I have to do one of these things. I don't do it well. Gotcha. Uh, no, and, no, and no, well, I didn't say that, but yeah. the, the shine is also because I have a light like directly above me and uh -huh. I, I probably am oily and need a shower. But uh, yeah, it's, I, it's 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 a shiny face. I wish yeah. I had my sunglasses for this up for this recording. Remind me next time we record, uh, or maybe um, borrow some makeup and splotch it on that forehead of yours. That would be that would be helpful. Uh, um, so next time um, we record, I will not be right underneath the lights in the residence <laughs> in off of Bullard, right by Surprise Stadium. No, you're good. You don't have one of those selfie lights in front of you right now. No, I, I'm not no. big time like that. I didn't get, oh, okay. uh, Entercom did not send me uh, one of those to make me look, you know, as, as, as pretty well, as, as possible. Well, I don't have one either, but you should feel good. I, I am, uh, I got this mic, especially for this new podcast we're doing. And for you listeners out there, um, we will banter back and forth quite a bit. I think one, you know, one of the things, and we can talk about this since this is our first episode, but one of the things that I really want to do with this is really just have some organic conversation about baseball uh, and just talk. You know, I, I think um, in a world of, of thoroughly planned podcasts, maybe let's refresh some listeners with just some two guys who love the game 
uh, and who have very different experiences in the game. And we spend, uh, we spent our careers and you are still spending your career, uh, in different parts of the ballpark. And so we kind of can combine two different, uh, point of views and, and really talk about the game and talk specifically, hopefully about the, the Rangers and you how know, the season's going and what's going on. You know what I wish I could like uncover. I'm sure that at some point, since we were both like, we grew up in the Metroplex and mm-hmm. you're like a year and a half older than I am. I'm sure at some point we faced each other in some capacity. Mm-hmm. Like I'm sure you struck me out in the, like the travel ball scene. Uh, who did you, who did you play for? I played for uh, uh, Dallas Tigers uh-huh. and D bat and D bat. So uh, what about you? I played for the Mustangs before the Mustangs merged with D bat. And then I think they yeah, yeah, yeah. unmerged yeah. with D bat, but okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, wouldn't you know that the lawnmowers just showed up <laughs> right I can't outside hear. I my off right, right outside my office. Anyway, maybe I'll turn my, I'll turn my camera a little bit. Oh, there you go. So you can get a good view of them there. Yeah. I see. Um, they always show up at the best times, but, um, yeah. So I guarantee you we faced each other. Well, I don't guarantee you're a little younger, so maybe not, but um, so I think about 20 minutes ago, you asked me what I'm up to these days. So I guess I can go ahead and answer that. But, um, <laughs> you know, my, my retirement from baseball has taken a turn towards health, I would say. So what I do now is I'm a lot healthier than I was when I played. And it's kind of a shame uh, that it took me retiring to really learn how to be healthy. But uh, I really began digging and thinking outside the box with health and um, it's hard not when you, when you're pursuing a career in major league baseball, uh, as much as we try to kid ourselves, it is, it is, there's a lot of selfishness that goes on. And actually there's a lot of selfishness that's kind of required, right? you you are in charge of you and you've kind of got to do whatever you got to do to stay there. Um, and kind of my, you know, I got there and had a little bit of success and had a lot of failure and had a lot of injuries and, Um, you know, when I retired and and wanted to do something else, I really wanted to do something that was more kind of, uh, others centric. So, uh, what I do now is I help people get healthy. So I help other people kind of crack the code on what the heck is going on with their health and why, um, whatever they're trying is not working. So if it was, if it was super easy to be healthy, then we wouldn't have the issues in this country that we're having. So I try to just take people back to the basics and really think about their health from almost like a primal ancestral way of living. Like there's so many things that we do in our world that just are not how we were meant to be. Right. So how to, how to be human again, right. If I were to write a book, maybe that would be the title of it, how to be human again. And it goes from anything from food to how we're sleeping to how I'm sitting in this chair right now. Um, to the computer screen I'm staring at, which most of us do all day long Mm -hmm. to spending out time outside in the sun and exercise and movement and what you're drinking. I mean, there's so many things that go into being healthy. It's not just a diet. In fact, I never use the word diet (laughs) because, because nobody wants to be on a diet. Nobody wants to be told you can't eat something, right? It's, um, it's, it's funny. It's, it's almost more important when you eat than it is even what you eat. So who knew that the, the greatest diet of all was actually not a diet at all. So, um, I really just try to change people's mindset about health, try to make, not make their lives miserable, but actually make them a little bit easier. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm doing. I, I partner with people and uh, actually partner with people and with companies. So, and, and help them on an annual basis. So it's fun. I like it. Do you, in what ways are you still involved or, or uninvolved in the sport of baseball? Good question. So I'm very involved with my kids. Okay. So I've got two boys and a little girl at home. Um, so I'm coaching both of my boys baseball teams. So I'm doing that. Uh, you know, they're all local kids in the community. So that's kind of how I keep my foot in the door, right. With baseball is teaching these young kids. Um, I also, um, am kind of getting my foot in the door at doing some throwing program development with some pitchers with the local high school. I live So I live over in Fairview. So if you're familiar with Lovejoy High School, um, trying to kind of create something for them. The biggest problem with with high school baseball is that there's just not enough time to really ramp up and throw. Um, 
and no one's really teaching a proper throwing program. The problem with throwing program is it take, you got to get out there and throw every day. Um, and so as somebody who's had many arm issues and arm injuries that happened in February and March, I am kind of, you know, just a little bit passionate about teaching kids how to actually get their arms ready for a season. Um, so I do that. Um, and then I, I, I really like the, uh, what do we, I guess mentor is, is a good word to put this on. Um, I want to be a mentor to as many kids as possible. So kids who love the game of baseball, who play the game, who just need some help navigating the ropes, right? From someone who's been there, who's been a high profile high school athlete to getting recruited for college, to entering a draft, like I want to be a mentor um, to them. And so me alongside some other guys that you've probably heard of that we'll talk about in future episodes um, are going to launch something called practice with pros uh, name kind of to be determined. Uh, we may, we may call it something else pro mentor. You guys will take a survey see what we should call it, but, but no throwing up a website and getting an app developed. That's, <clears throat> that's going to allow kids, not just from baseball, but from any sport uh, tap on the shoulder of, a, of a current or former pro and, ask them questions, uh, and be able to kind of lean on them for guidance. Um, it could be skill specific. Hey, check out this video of my swing. What do you think? Or it could be, Hey, I threw 160 pitches last night. <laughs> what do you think about that? You know? So, <laughs> um, it's just, it's just a way to kind of give back. I mean, every single guy, I can't say every single guy, but so many guys that played the game and are done, they might not want to be coaches. Um, but they want to, they want to be involved and they really want to share some of the knowledge <clears throat> that they've got. I mean, the, the, the tricky thing with baseball players are really just athletes in general is, you know, if I was a physician or a lawyer or whatever, I'm kind of an expert in my field and I'm going to do that until I retire at the ripe old age of 62 or whatever it is. Um, baby baseball is very different, right? I was an expert in my field and did it for a very short amount of time. And, and now I'm done. And the moment that I finished playing, my expertise didn't just vanish into midair. Like it's still in me. Um, and there's not really a way to get it out uh, unless you want to coach. So what we're trying to do is there's a lot of just wasted floating baseball knowledge out there. So how do we tap into that? And how do we let amateur athletes uh, use that as a resource? So that's what we're trying to build. So, you, you mentioned arm injuries. I think mm -hmm. if, if we make our first tie into Rangers baseball, and, and it's really not just Rangers baseball. This is Major League Baseball, college baseball. I mean, you talked about high school baseball. It's, it's all baseball. Yeah. Uh, the, minute, the minute kids start actually throwing a baseball with some degree of, of force, arm injuries come into play. You know, the, the eighth, eight year old and I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. The eight year old who's just like lollipopping it back and forth, probably not dealing with any sort of arm shoulder elbow stuff, but the Rangers recently were hit with two uh, big name players dealing with uh, arm injuries, Jose Leclerc uh, and Jonathan Hernandez. And I know like when you're a fan of a team and maybe you don't have, and it's tough to have a grasp of like what's going on with all 30 teams. You feel like your team is the one that deals with this the most. And I know this because I have Rangers fans who will constantly ask me, why does it seem like the Rangers deal with arm injuries more than anyone else? And I, I, you know, I don't know what the total numbers are like across the league. And one of the tough things to gauge is for like really young kids you don't hurt your arm. Like the moment you hurt your arm, right? Like sometimes it's like build up over uh, a few months, a few years. So mm -hmm. does this stem back to, at, you know, in high school or college and, but like, there just seems to be such a mystery. And so I guess the first thing I'm curious about, because I've got my like ignorant thoughts on what could lead to an arm injury or like looking at a guy, eyeballing a guy and thinking, no, oh, this guy's a Tommy John waiting to happen. Like there, but like how much education were you given as a player to try and enhance your ability to stay healthy? Well, you know, zero coming up through high school. Um, that just wasn't a thing. And I, and that's the landscape of that's changed dramatically as injuries have continued to increase. There's a lot of awareness about that now. 
um, the advice that's given around that is, is hit or miss, I think. But um, yeah, so I knew very little. So coming up in high school, I was a, um, I was good high school pitcher. Like you were a really good high school pitcher. I I was probably better. I was probably a better pitcher in high school than I ever was in the major leagues. And I, and that's kind of a joke, but kind of not like, I really was, I don't know that. I don't know that I ever really reached the potential that I had pre injury. Um, if that makes any sense. So I, I, you know, going through high school, um, my first game senior year, uh, threw a pitch in like the third inning pitching against the woodlands, uh, in a, in like a tournament first, you know, first tournament of the season and just kind of felt like one pitch, right? Like a rubber band snapping in my elbow. And that's kind of when I had my first Tommy John surgery. Um, it wasn't until that point that I had any education on arm injuries, you know, rehab. I wasn't doing, I wasn't doing band work or shoulder care. I wasn't doing any of those things. Uh, even as somebody who had a lot of exposure traveling around the country, playing with, you know, team USA, like, like I, I played with the best guys and I still didn't have that kind of, uh, education on, on arm care and prevention and that kind of thing. Um, like I said, I think that's changed, you know, you get into college and you, and you learn and you grow, you get into the major leagues and, and, you know, every single team is outfitted with a, a ridiculous amount of uh, therapists and physical therapists and athletic trainers who are teaching these guys and coming up through the mile how to properly take care of their arm. They're all doing an amazing job. So there's, there's no lack of that now at, at all. Um, it doesn't seem like it's slowing down injuries though, right? It, if anything, they seem to be increasing as we continue to increase awareness and stuff around arm injuries, uh, and strength and conditioning. I mean, it just seems like injuries continue to increase with that. And so you kind of have to sit back and say, well, what's going on? What is the reason for that? Um, you know, every guy throws really hard now. That's just, it's just the way it is. So I think that has something to do with it, right? We are human and, and our arms were meant to, uh, move at a certain speed and we are breaking through that ceiling and, and our arms are having a hard time slowing themselves down uh, because they're moving so fast. And, and I think that, you know, with continued research and development and training, we'll, we'll figure it out, right. We'll figure out how to, how to stop the, the monster that is arm injuries. Um, but right now, I don't know. I mean, if I knew the answer, then I'd be working for somebody else. Right. We'd, if, we'd if be I knew. calling up your agent if you knew the answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We would talk to my agent about it, but, but like, isn't it I bad? I, I, Oh, I'm sorry, Sean. I, isn't it bad? Like Jonathan Hernandez, all right? Yep. Probably this team's best pitcher. I mean, obviously mm-hmm. his role is is not as a starter, but like he was one of the best pitchers in baseball last year. It's bad. I feel like that. I look at him and I think, and 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 I hope this isn't what's ultimately playing out. But he throws around a hundred with sink. Like, when's it going to happen? And like the Rangers have the second pick in the draft. Two of the, the top prospects are pitchers from Vanderbilt, Kumar Rocker and Jack Leiter. Mm-hmm. And this, this doesn't necessarily influence my desire for the Rangers to draft one of those guys. And there's a kid from Jesuit, Jordan Lawler, who's also in the conversation mm-hmm. uh, as well, but he's a shortstop, not a pitcher, but like with Rocker and Leiter, when I'm, I'm like thinking, Oh, you know, if, if they draft this guy or that guy, like this, this is going to happen. And, and maybe they're big leaguers by this age or whatever. But like, I just kind of been resigned to the fact that at some point they're going to have Tommy John and, and maybe they won't, but like, that's not good. But unfortunately, I think it's just the reality. I just like, I hate that it is the reality because Tommy John's not a, a, a three month recovery. Now it's a lot, you know, the, the recovery is a lot, maybe more, uh, successful now than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. I mean, it used to be like a, a career death sentence, but that doesn't make it an easy process. Like I hear people say, whenever someone's dealing with an elbow injury, Oh, just go ahead and have Tommy John. Like, let's just get it over with. And like, yeah, that's, I, that's, I, that's a joke. Yeah. Yeah. I get that sentiment. I understand it. And, and sometimes it does go down that path, but like, it's not a given, like there, not everyone comes back successfully from Tommy John. It's not easy. You know, this Mm -hmm. is, it's not like you're just going to wake up one day and all of a sudden you're going to throw like you used to. And so I just, it kills me. It seems like the only sport where something, this sort of like dynamic exists where 
it almost at times feels inevitable. I think it was like Mike Maddox once said, there are two types of pitchers, those who have had Tommy John and those who are going to have Tommy John. And I mean, yeah, it does feel I, like I hate that. that. Yeah, it does feel like that. I mean, it's not, it's not inaccurate either. I mean, I, I have the same thoughts, you know, I, you know, I watch Hernandez throw and I, I you know, you, you, you definitely have those thoughts that come into mind. I actually saw him just the other day. Uh, I have got my own arm injury of myself I'm dealing with right now. So, uh, you know, it's funny, uh, definitely not a throwing injury. So <laughs> hurt my left shoulder. Uh, I was hiking with my two boys up in Oklahoma and, you know, trying to be cool, fun dad, you know, you try to walk across a tree that's going over a Creek and, you know, you just underestimate how much you weigh, I think sometimes. And that tree did not hold my weight. So branch snap, I fall, I fall about 20 feet into the Creek bed and land on my left shoulder and like shoulder pops out. So dislocated shoulder. And I mean, I am, I'm in pain, like the worst pain I've ever been in. Um, so got it, had to go to the ER. They popped my shoulder back in. I get home and I'm just, I mean, I'm having a hard time. I'm in a lot of pain. So I, I go see Dr. Meister cause he's my guy, right? <laughs> I don't know how many appointments I've had with him over the years, but but go to see Dr. Meister and who's, if for y'all listening, don't know, he's the, the Rangers team physician and, and he takes a look at it and, uh, we do an MRI and, you know, I've got a torn labrum as well. So I'm doing, I'm doing what I can. I'm doing physical therapy all the time now, trying to get back. I'm no stranger to physical therapy, but, um, I, I, I got to see Jonathan Hernandez, uh, working out over at his, Dr. Meister's facility when I was over there, just popping my head in to hang out for a little bit. I've watched a few guys throw bullpens just for the fun of it. And it felt good to see them, but, but you're right. I mean, it's, it does kind of feel inevitable sometimes. And even, even as a pitcher, it feels inevitable. Um, you really never feel, uh, invincible to injuries as a pitcher, no matter how much, every guy's taking care of themselves. That's not a question. You very, very few pitchers are just, uh, taking the back seat on, on working out and arm care. Right. And, um, because of what I know now, um, I think most guys are taking a back seat on other things that could be, uh, contributing to their health, uh, and their recovery and that kind of thing. But, you know, if we're going to keep throwing a hundred, we're going to keep having arm injuries. Um, <laughs> at least until we, until we figure it out. So there's a, there's a really cool new arm care slash workout machine. It's called the Proteus. You'll have to Google it sometime, but it looks like a robot. And this thing, I really think it could be effective in, in helping prevent some of these arm injuries. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do a little digging on it, but I think, I think there's kind of a future for this little contraption and in helping pitchers, especially kind of prevent arm injuries. It just seems like, you know, we have cars that drive themselves. Uh, I think I, I saw that there's like one of the, I don't know if it's one of the, the rugby associations in Europe, just for like a specific country or just the, the European rugby league, whatever it is that they're now able to test saliva and within a day, know whether yeah. or not someone has a concussion. Like, it just seems like there are all these technological advances and, it's not for a lack of effort. I mean, you better believe that we got pitchers getting paid millions and millions and millions of dollars, you know, upwards of Trevor Bauer, 40 million a year uh, teams mm -hmm. hair teams are teams are searching the efforts there, but I just, you know, th this is one of the biggest challenges it seems to try and overcome because it, it, it almost seems like they're, you know, trying to navigate through a house that they've never been in with the lights off and it's pitch black and they don't have a flashlight. Like they're trying to yeah, get to where they want to go, but they're just, there's no direction. It's baseball's baseball's interesting. And, and I don't know what this is like in other sports. Cause I have no experience in other sports, but baseball's a little bit old school in its mindset and baseball players are a little bit prideful, uh, maybe a lot prideful actually. Um, the technology exists to be able to look at something and say, this guy should not play today, or this guy should not pitch today. Like we know that, um, there's, you know, I track my, I track my biological data close enough these days that if I were playing today, I would be able to wake up and say, I shouldn't pitch today. Give me the day off. 
because I don't want to get hurt. Right. You know, it's not pinpoint, but, but that technology exists. The problem in lies a player, right. And I was the same way as a player, right. You've got a sense of pride, right. I, you know, I was a reliever. I want to show up for the team every single day. Right. Not only do I want to, and I have this pride uh, to do so, but I also know that the success of my career di- dictates the success of my contract and dictates, you know, a lot of things. And, and what's going to influence that is how many times I can get out on the mound in a season. And so as a player, I mean, you want to be out there, uh, even when you shouldn't, you, you want to be out there. And um, as with a lot of things in life, sometimes pride kind of gets in the way of that. And, and teams too, you know, players are, players are a little bit leery to give out too much information to the team. So, you know, if, if the technology exists and you've got someone staffed on your team and their only job is to monitor the health of the players and you're doing so, and, and you're looking at, you're looking at numbers that, you know, you can see how late a player stayed up that night. Uh, what time they woke up. Um, You can look at numbers and probably get a good idea of how many drinks they had that night. Um, You could dig into their genetics and see, you know, what's good and what's bad. What can we prevent through through your genetics and stuff like that? There's a lot of information out there, but I mean, if I was a player, do I want to give that info over to a team? Maybe not. You know, they might, they may or may not use that information against me. Uh, in a contract negotiation in the future, right? If, if I'm a player who is performing well and I like to stay out late and party, right? You know, that, that could go against me in some sort of contract negotiation, but that's kind of, you know, I don't think there'll ever be a perfect solution there. I think players are always kind of trying to protect themselves. You brought up something that, you know, we've talked about the, the pride and, and the demonstration of availability and when you say that, the first thing I think of is game 161 in 2015. And I want to, one of these episodes, I want to really like dig into 2015 and maybe we get one of your teammates on because that was a really cool year. Uh, and I know it was a, a, a cool year for you because I don't know, is, is that the best year of your career? Would you say like as a major leaguer? For sure. Yeah. It took over yeah. As, as you were a big part of a, a, a bullpen that went from kind of unreliable to all of a sudden maybe the rock of a a team that came back after a rough start to win the division and Mm -hmm. uh game 161 was the game which the angels came back late and that was your fifth straight day pitching fourth what was that was my fifth uh game 161 161 was my fifth day in a row so I believe it was my fifth day in a row maybe no off day in between any of those so it's five games in a row and um you know, I, I don't trust me. I don't Google my name often, you know, just once a day or so, but, um, <laughs> there was, a uh, someone let me know the other day. It's a, it's a buddy of mine that I talk to a lot. He's like a, you know, he's a stat freak. He just like likes to look at this stuff, but he told me that I am the, la- I am the last pitcher that, um, has ever that threw five games in a row last reliever that was done that. So it's been since 2015, since a pitcher did that. And that was me. And he made the bold prediction and said, you will be the last one that has ever done that. I I mean, Um, unless there is technology that would allow for that sort of usage, like you should be the last one. Like there are pitchers who pitch five straight playoff games, but there are off days mixed in. And I I just remember you taking the mound thinking, man, like what a bulldog, but he has no business pitching today, but it was a big game. The Rangers were trying to clinch the division and you were the, the stud of the back end of the bullpen. Yeah. Were you like, was there ever any thought like, Hey, maybe I shouldn't be pitching and and I need to say something. Cause like, my thought is if you do say that, then you are viewed upon negatively as not being there for your team and and not be like, it just seems like that, that dynamic is, is almost off. Like we, Yeah. yeah, Sean, you should be available for this outing, even though it might wreck your career. Well, we can talk about that. I mean, you know, you could, you could make a pretty fair argument and say that it did wreck my career. Yeah. Um, and you know, I don't, you know, did I ever pitch successfully in the big leagues after that? No. Well, so you, you I mean, go to, you go no, to, no, really I didn't. Yeah, 20, and, I, 20, and I'm, 
I was going to say, 2016, you start as the closer, and then you ended up passing it to Sam Dyson because you had a tough year. A really tough year. Um, And so, yeah, you know, it's, it's the same dynamic we talked about, right? I it's, it's, it's pride, right? So did I have thoughts cross in my head um, that I should not be on the mound? Absolutely. Like hundred percent. Did I feel like I had my best stuff? Absolutely not. Um, Did I want to be there for my team in a crucial part of the season because I had helped uh, get us there? Absolutely. I wanted to be there. Did I want to be there for, you know, the fans, absolutely. I wanted to be there. Right. You, you kind of, you know, you kind of want to be a hero. Um, and so definitely pride got in the way right there. Right. So if I'm, if I'm, you know, wiser in my years, you know, I, maybe I, maybe I make that call, but, but would I have made a different decision? No, I, I wouldn't have, you know, I, it would have been this, it would have been the same decision today, even knowing what I know now, just because, it feels like the most important thing in the world. Right. And, and you just, you'll, you, you just want to show up, you want to show up for everybody. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, you know, if I'm remembering correctly, was this was against Anaheim, I think. Yep. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think I remind me what happened in game that fifth game in a row I pitched, but I, I came in for a save or came in with a tie game and blew the lead. Um, I think something like that. And then um, we went into the playoffs that year. Um, and, you know, I, you know, kind of had closed most of that season and then get into playoffs. And I mean, tough to argue against putting Dyson out there to close at that time. Right. He is, his stuff was absurdly good. Um, but, you know, never really got a chance to close in the playoffs that, that season um, and did that, did that fifth game in a row impact that decision? Absolutely. Right. I didn't have my best stuff. I was exhausted. It had been a long season. Um, and, and so that was, that was even a little bit hard for me, right. That was kind of like a pride pill you had to swallow, right. Walking in to the manager's office and him saying, Hey, you know, thanks for, thanks for closing all year. But, um, I, you know, I, I gotta give this to Dyson right now, you know, tough to argue against Dyson stuff, but it's still, you know, it, it hurt a little bit, right? At the same time, you, you got to show up. It's the playoffs you want to do. Ultimately, you're just trying to win. You're just trying to win games. Um, hey, can I yeah, just quickly you know, add something for people who don't remember? You For sure. You, you did in that that year uh, in the postseason, you did go three scoreless, including, if I'm not mistaken, uh, one of the – was it game one or game two that went to extra innings? Uh, I think it was game two you pitched two scoreless in Toronto in extra innings. And those are, I mean, it it wasn't a safe situation, but if you give up one run against the lineup that had like 17 guys that could hit a home run at, you know, the drop of a hat, then the game's over. So I just want to make sure people know that you did kind of bounce back and have a, a a really good series. Unfortunately, the the team ended up losing in five, but I just have to give you some love and and throw that out there. (laughs) I appreciate that. I think even myself, I kind of forget about that. Um, sometimes I, I look back, I look back at 2015 and think about, I, you know, it's, it's harder. Just, you think about just how it ended the regular season. Um, and so thanks for that little pat on the back. Cause I yeah. kind of forget about that, but I think that those were my only two playoff appearances of my career. So glad they were successful. I mean, obviously, really wish that series. We should do a whole episode on that series. Yeah. That would be a fun one. I think the fans would probably like that, getting a little bit of an inside perspective on on that Toronto series. Lots of good Ranger memories that came out of that. We and we probably have, I mean, we we definitely have two very different perspectives uh from those five games and the seven or eight days during which it took place. Uh yeah. And we were, I don't know if you remember this, we were separated on the plane by like one row, one or two rows. I was on the right side with uh, team photographer, Kelly Gavin. You were on the left side with your wife uh, and you were at the front of the player section. Um, and I was at the very back of the non-player section. And <laughs> I have some very strong memories, not necessarily about you, but in general, what that experience was like flying back from Toronto after s- after you know basically having your hearts ripped out from you uh and i was fascinated as i mean i think you grew up a rangers fan right we both grew up yeah diehard rangers fans 
Yeah. You know, you got to wear the Jersey. I I'm incredibly fortunate to get to, to broadcast for the team, but like to, to view that through the lens, not as a broadcaster, but of a, a fan who's like in this plane with a bunch of guys, like, and you always wonder like what that's like, we've got it. We've got to talk about that. Maybe that's our, our next episode is 2015. Yeah, let's and, do it. In that, in that series. I, cause yeah. I'd love to hear, I've never really talked to you in depth about that series. And that had a bunch of fascinating turns to it. So it did. It did. I, you know, I can't, <laughs> I can't, it definitely, that series definitely really changed my, uh, um, you know, changed uh, in, in some ways it kind of changed my whole uh, life. <laughs> really. There was a lot of, there was a lot of really good, just teaching moments in that series um, that have kind of carried me through even what I'm doing today. So. Oh, uh, that's perfect. So our homework assignment is to come up with a name. And if you're I, watching I, this, no, I don't do homework. Okay. Well, yeah. then you can administer homework for your kids <laughs> who I know do homework. Right. Perfect. Uh, yeah. If if you're watching uh, or listening and you've got an idea for the name of this, uh, you can let us know. Uh, Sean is is on Twitter, right? What's the what's the Twitter handle? A am I on Twitter? I don't know. I feel like I, I know you're know. on Instagram. Are you on Twitter? You are, I you mean, know, you are, I, right? It's Sean, uh, it's like Sean uh, underscore Tollison. I'll tell you, I don't know that I even have the Twitter app on my phone. So if yeah. I am on Twitter, go find me, but I, you know, it's going to be hard to connect with me there. Okay. Um, you can tweet you me can, at you can, Jared Sandler. <laughs> you can tweet him. Um, no, but definitely let us know your ideas for the name of the show. Uh, and please don't submit anything unless it's clever. Cause we won't, we'll just overlook it. Um, <laughs> but no, this has been, this has been good, man. I think, I think we'll, I think we'll have a lot of good things to talk about. I'm looking forward to this. So there you go. Episode one of the unnamed podcast, Sean Tollison, Jared Sandler. We'll talk to you in a few weeks.